Hey, it's me, Jen again, and today's guest has medical innovation in his job description. We'll hear from Dr. John Russell of Johns Hopkins Medicine coming up. If you value this content, please subscribe to this channel because that really helps YouTube to put these videos in front of more people. And that helps more people be able to save their thyroid from surgery through radiofrequency ablation, a treatment that shrinks thyroid nodules directly and preserves the thyroid gland itself. Today's guest is no stranger to being on the forefront of medicine, first through a scarless thyroid surgery technique and now through thyroid RFA. Dr. John Russell is passionate about solving thyroid problems and then using that data to solve other problems in the body. His excitement about this is contagious as he describes new innovations on the horizon for the care of thyroid nodules. Let's talk now with Dr. Russell. It's really Thank awesome you. to meet you. <laughs> Likewise. You know, it's funny, 80% of Americans, like you know, have a thyroid nodule. The fact that Anybody that finds out that they have a thyroid nodule, the only thing that they think about is surgery. The vast majority of them will never need surgery. And yet, you know, five to 10% of those nodules are palpable, which means they at least have some symptoms from it. Mm -hmm. And if we can take most of those patients and move them away from the surgery paradigm, and let's be honest, I'm a surgeon, I love surgery. <laughs> but at the same time, you know, even more than what I love, you want to do what actually is going to help your patient. It's so exciting to hear doctors say that. The vast majority of the patients in our Facebook group, which is now close to 2,400 people. Oh my goodness. Yeah, which is like <laughs> mind blowing to me. Um, you know, two years ago, I started this group July of 2019. I was excited when 40 people were in the group. <laughs> So to think that it's 2,400, I'm just like, wow, I cannot believe this. But at the same time, I'm, I'm also not really surprised because there's so much more talk about RFA now in the community. So just thinking about how many people go to their doctor and their doctor's just like, no, thyroid RFA is bad and it's not what you want to do. It's going to cause all these problems, you know. So when I talk to doctors like you and all these other doctors who are offering this, and hearing the excitement in their voice and what their focus is more on what's best for the patient. Like you were just saying, this is going to help the patient have a better quality of life down the road. That resonates with patients so much. They well, want to know I, that their doctor's on their side. So when I finished my training and back then it was, if you showed up in my office as a surgeon, we were having a very short conversation. Do you want surgery or don't you? And if it's cancer, you have to have surgery and that's that. And if it's not cancer, well, then it's about quality of life, right? And, and if it's so bad that you need to take out your thyroid, then you have surgery. And if it's not, you don't. And it's a very simple, straightforward conversation. Right. And then, you know, we started to do scarless thyroid surgery. And so all of a sudden the conversations get a little bit longer because that's not for everybody. And maybe it's for you. And this is the pros and cons of that. And then we start, you know, we start to do active surveillance for some small thyroid cancers that not everybody, even with cancer necessarily needs to be having surgery. Mm -hmm. And so the conversation gets a little bit longer <laughs> and then you start to throw radio frequency in there. And all of a sudden these conversations that used to be a nice, clean five minute conversation are just huge. And we aren't even talking about molecular markers and these conversations have just exploded, but it's, it's great, you know, and, and partly because of groups like this one, Patients just come in with so much knowledge. I enjoy the conversations a lot more. Now, that being said, they come again, the conversations go on longer, but, yeah. but just when you have a more informed patient, it's, a, it's just a lot more engaging. It feels more rewarding as the surgeon to be able to like really go through these options and feel like you can do a very personalized approach for each patient. So many patients are coming to the group and they're like hungry for knowledge. They want to know what their options are. They want to be informed. They don't want to make snap decision about having their thyroid removed. And, you know, we talk about having long-term thinking, not thinking just about, okay, I'm going to have surgery and then have immediate relief, but what are the long-term ramifications of having no thyroid and having to take medication and, and all of the side effects that can come along from you know, maybe not doing well in particular medication. The paradigm seems to be shifting and it's really cool. I will say that uh, such a high percentage of my conversations now end with a, okay, what is your primary objective? You know, because right. some patients walk in and they're like, I'm terrified that this thing will become cancer. Right. And you say right off the gate, okay, well then radio frequency is 
probably not the best thing for you because I'm not going to get rid of this nodule. It's still going to be with you and I'm going to shrink it. And you know, if we, maybe if we do multiple treatments and it's small enough to start off with, we can make it almost invisible. On the other hand, people come in and they say, oh my goodness, I really don't want to be taking thyroid hormone. You know, it's funny the number of people that say, what if there's a zombie apocalypse and I can't get my Synthroid from Walmart, you know, <laughs> and, and hopefully there will not be a zombie apocalypse. But you, that, I mean, we all understand that idea of being reliant on a medication or right. a hormone in this case. My conversation is, what is your driving motivator? And most of the time patients have two or three and you just have to say, okay, you've got to pick what's the most important thing. So many conversations end with, okay, these are the pros and cons. I think you now understand them. You need to go home and think about it and then just reach out to me. And if I have something that can help you, great. And if I don't, you know, it's a benign nodule. Two years from now, it's still going to be a benign nodule. And we can have that conversation then. It's a very rewarding thing. To, and and I, I will say one of the things that I'm, and I was actually talking to, you know, a colleague out at Stanford just, just yes, last night. We were just talking about how our specialty has morphed so much right. to where, you know, a few years ago, some people said, oh, well, you can be a general surgeon and you can and you can also do thyroid surgery or you can be an ENT and you can also do thyroid surgery. But I think we're kind of going away from that. Just the subspecialization that it takes to really be able to have a thorough conversation with patients and really dig into the nitty gritty and say, here's my toolkit. You know, these are all the things that I offer for you. What is the one for you? I think as a patient and, and you alluded to this earlier. I think as a patient, sometimes you go to a doctor who only does one thing, right? You're either a surgeon and all you do is make a big scar across people's necks. And anybody that wants anything other than that, you're probably not going to talk it up, right? Because you don't do radiofrequency, you don't do scarless thyroid surgery, you don't do minimally invasive anything. And I think just the more things you have in your toolkit, the easier it is to personalize. I think you were really going to see as patients get informed about what the options are, you're going to see that all of a sudden the patients start to drive this further differentiation and specialization of surgeons to uh, to really be able to help make sure patients are taken care of. I agree. I think the future of medicine is personalized medicine. And I've heard several physicians say that, and it makes complete sense because we are not all the same. We have different sensitivities and different health issues that we all face. And it just makes more sense to treat that person in light of those factors. It's exciting to me that, that this is available now and that well, it's more common. I have the privilege of being at Johns Hopkins, which is really a great benefit because I get to just do this one thing. You know what I mean? If you, if you live in one of these small towns, your mm -hmm. doctor has to do everything. You know what I mean? Because that's, mm -hmm. you're the only person for 500 miles around. Yeah. And, and I think... It's great with social media that patients can find out, hey, you know, it, it might take a plane flight, it might take, you know, a, a long drive somewhere, but mm -hmm. I do have things that are available. Yes, and I drove nine hours to get mine. Oh my goodness. It was totally worth it. Totally twice, worth it, exactly. Twice, actually, I drove nine hours. It's worth it to other patients. Uh, I'm not the only weirdo out there who wants to go traveling across the country for this. It's becoming more and more worthwhile to patients to get what they feel is the best option for them. Even in the group, we have several patients all ac across the globe and patients will go from in one country to another if they right. can access the care they need. Well, and it's, it's not exciting. for everybody, right? Like you, like right. you said, like, even if it's just, you know, 20 or 30% of patients, that's a huge number of patients. And just having these options available and realizing that, you know, if you are in a small town, you probably don't know about all these different options. And there's so many ways that you can just get information about it and find out, am I a candidate for this? And your group is totally one of the most influential based on the feedback I get from my patients. Are you hearing a lot about the group from your patients? I would say maybe 70 to 80% of my patients refer to this group. Oh so, my goodness. And I don't know that they all find RFA through the group. Some of them might be like, we talk to them about RFA and then they go to the group. But yeah, keep on keeping on. <laughs> oh my goodness. That's exciting and humbling at the same time. Wow. Well, yes, we will We will keep doing what we can. We are always trying to figure out ways to improve on the group and help more patients. That is very motivating. So I'm curious, would you say you're doing more RFAs or more ethanol lesions for, for benign nodules? 
more RFA. So ethanol really? ablation, like you know, it's good for cystic nodules. Mm -hmm. And for solid nodules, most people think that RFA is better. Mm -hmm. RFA is a lot easier to control because you actually know exactly where the energy is going and what you're going to destroy. Mm -hmm. Whereas with ethanol, you're just kind of like casting your bread upon the waters and then hoping that something dies and mm -hmm. you, know, you can't really control. Also, you know, having operated on the necks of people who have been treated with ethanol afterwards, there is a lot of scar tissue that happens right around the, the sites that are treated. And at least by report, the people that have radiofrequency ablation do not have quite as much scar tissue surrounding the thyroid. Mm -hmm. I haven't operated on anybody that's had RFA yet. They haven't required it, but that's the reports that we have heard is that it's not quite as bad as the ethanol. I haven't encountered a physician who has yet in the United States. Yeah. I'm curious to, to see what that would be like. How often are you needing to use a combination of ethanol and RFA, because there's a lot of patients who come to their group and say, well, I've got this huge thyroid nodule and it's very cystic, but it's also got solid components. Which do I need or do I need both? Those are interesting questions. And I don't know that we have it exactly figured out right now. Okay. I mean, ethanol has a lot of advantages just given the fact that it's got a long track record. Mm -hmm. It's invariably, it's covered by insurance, you know, and, and it's pretty accessible relative to radio frequency ablation. A lot right. more people do it. I would say that it's hard to say if somebody wants to just try ethanol ablation for the cystic component of their thyroid nodule, it's hard to tell them that it's a bad idea to start with that. On the other hand, there's patients that come in and they just want to be definitive, right? Like, hey, let's just hit this thing and be done with it and hopefully get as much as we can. And those are the patients where we'll try and do like a combo approach, you know, where we'll aspirate all the fluid, maybe do the ethanol first, maybe do the radio frequency and then do the ethanol, kind of try and tailor it to what we think is going to get the best result. Yeah, it's again, an individualized approach. Yeah. I've heard yeah. so many different opinions on, you know, whether you should just do RFA and that that would handle the cystic component. And, and several other doctors say, no, the ethanol is really important to get rid of that. If you have all that fluid in there and that superheated tip of the probe for the RFA, it's just going to boil the fluid. So I, I do think it does, it does depend somewhat on the case and how much fluid you're dealing with. What about small cancers? Are, are you thinking that's coming soon? Is that happening yeah. yet? So we have been trying for a year and a half. Anytime you do something that's, that's kind of cutting edge like that, it requires what's called an institutional review board. That involves, you know, other scientists, other doctors, people from the community, other patients, like a whole group of people has to meet together and say, oh, well, you're not being some crazy wacko doctor, like just trying right. to do something that you shouldn't do. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you say the C word, everybody like gets super excited, right? Like, oh my goodness. And here's what we know about small thyroid cancers. Almost never will they kill you. Operating on them is generally not mandatory depending on where they are within the thyroid nodule. And again, that's a multidisciplinary decision, right? And so if you just see your endocrinologist and they say, oh, you don't need surgery, you should still be seeing a surgeon because we still look at things differently. Mm -hmm. And then hopefully you have a surgeon who's not just always going to say, yes, you need surgery. Right. Which is a whole different conversation. But, you know, there's a lot of nuance that goes into it. And it really does take a team to mm -hmm. be able to make that decision that you shouldn't be having surgery. As we are trying to get this through our institutional review board, even in the last week, I'm, I'm talking with them. As oh, we're talking wow. to them, we're trying to explain it's okay to do nothing with these patients. And if it's okay to do nothing with them, why isn't it also okay to say, well, let's treat these small cancers with radiofrequency because we know that the very small ones are the most likely to completely disappear. I think it has a lot of promise. Now, it's been a year and a half that we've been trying to convince them of this and they are slowly coming around. I think we're close. And I think Good. we're hopefully within the next month or two gonna be able to start with treating these. What's interesting to me is that this time has not been time lost because you would think that the smallest ones are the easiest to treat, but that's actually exactly opposite because the smaller nodules are much harder to position your needle probe mm -hmm. right in the middle of the cancer and then try to treat it and kill it. And so it's actually been really good time for all of us as we start to rack up numbers of, the, mm -hmm. of who we treat of practicing getting our needle tip exactly where we want it so that we can have more surgical precision as we're trying to treat these small cancers. And so, yes, I'm, I'm upset that we haven't been able to do it. And it's been a year and a half that we've been trying to do it for these mm -hmm. small cancers. But at the same time, 
clearly when we start, I will be better prepared. As we travel to Asia and we work with our colleagues over in Asia, they've been doing this for 20 years. And we know as surgeons, there's so much literature that the more you do something, the better you get at it, right? Okay. And you can see these curves of the amount of energy that we apply and how much it's going to result in you know, destruction of the nodule and how, how much shrinkage you will get from the nodule. And we know that there's a learning curve and we all feel more confident and we do, th do this better the more we do. I think in the end, it's probably going to be just fine that we have been going slow with doing this. I think it will help our results to be better when we actually do start doing it. Some of us are impatient. I know there's many patients who are like, when are they going to do it in the U.S.? Because they're doing it overseas. And I'm like, it takes time to get all this, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's just been FDA cleared for two years now. And hopefully it's going to gain more prominence. It seems like it's kind of exploding a little bit. Is that the, the sense that you have? One, 100%. <laughs> it, I very reasonably and i told you already i love doing surgery but very easily if i wanted to just shut down all surgery and just do radio frequency within about two months my practice would be full of just radio frequency it's crazy this is a procedure like you said it wasn't even there two years ago yeah and now there is so much demand for it and so whenever we go to these meetings it's kind of like those of us that do it have this rallying cry like and there's yeah. so many of our surgical colleagues that say hey, you know, I'm a surgeon and this is what I do. And we have to say, listen up. Like, it's not about what you were trained. It's about there is a demand for this technology that is safe and mm -hmm. has been proven and learn it already. Because, mm -hmm. and, and this is my personal bias, I, I kind of think that surgeons, given our anatomic training, you know, we know where the nerve is, we know how to protect it, we know how to deal with any complications. I kind of think that we have this responsibility to really be leading this charge to be able to offer all of these interventions to our patients. You know, sometimes I, I have to just remind my colleagues, this is not about you. This is about like, what is best for your patient? And if you can learn how to do it, learn how to do it. You know? I love your passion about this. That's what I'm getting from the patient side is patients are becoming more courageous and willing to advocate for themselves because they just want something that's going to preserve their gland. So it's just, it's so exciting to see the excitement on your end too. You mentioned a second ago, going to Asia and training. Is that how you initially were trained in RFA? Yeah. So it's actually interesting. So I finished my training in 2015 here in the, and I actually trained first at the Cleveland Clinic and then I went to Johns Hopkins. So with Ralph Tafano, who I think you, you talked to yeah. a while about was already working on some MRI guided, and at that time it was HIFU, so high intensity focused ultrasound, which mm -hmm. by the way, stay tuned because that's gonna be even cooler than radio frequency a few years from now. Because, really? So, so here's HIFU. HIFU has the promise to be able to put these paddles on the outside of your neck and triangulate the sonographic energy uh -huh. so that you can actually kill things without even using a needle. And so, like that's that's going to happen and it's not very far away and by, by not very far away probably means 15 years in medical speak right but, <laughs> but like you know but th there is so much cool stuff happening right now like i always joke that we're gonna when i when i give lectures i always say look it's gonna be that as you walk through the scanner at the airport, we're gonna treat your thyroid nodule at the same time, you know? And, that, and it's, <laughs> it's not gonna be like that, but it is getting so cool, the number of things that we can do. I love thyroid problems because thyroid problems generally aren't going to kill patients. Right. And so it's about quality of life, right? And that gives us so much freedom to be able to use the thyroid as kind of this investigational playground. I apologize to all the patients out there, but it, but it really is, right? Like we, we know that this is about your quality of life. And so if we do radio frequency ablation and we don't shrink your nodule 50% the first time, like we hope we do, well, that's okay. You know, it's not okay. And we want to do it 50%. I, and that sounds almost flippant, but, but we can learn and we can grow and we can get better and we can perfect it. And then we can take these techniques and we can apply them to other areas of the body. How much of this can we go on to treat other head and neck cancers? You know, right. things in the parotid, squamous cell carcinoma that normally we treat with radiation. You know, so many of these things, as we get better, it really is just this great toehold to really start getting better and doing less and less invasive and really improving the quality of life of patients all throughout the body. And so my colleagues, again, they kind of say, you know, 
why do you just focus on the thyroid? That's crazy. Don't you get bored? And the answer is no way, because you can do so much in the thyroid that then sets you up to be able to really perfect and bring these technologies to the, all the rest of everything that we do in the head and neck. It's fantastic. It's interesting. You talk about how, the playground aspect of it and the parathyroids is one area that when I was reading about the scarless thyroidectomy, how I believe you even said it in a video I watched where you said it's even easier to protect the parathyroids when you're doing the transoral approach because you can visualize them better. Transoral surgery, I love the scarless vestibular surgery, mm -hmm. not just because, oh, there's no scar and so nobody can tell that you had surgery. And right. you know, if you have Graves disease, which is one thing that radiofrequency does not treat, right? At least not right now. You know, we can fix your whole problem and a week later it's like nothing even happened to you and it's just gone. Except for, of course, you have to take levothyroxine. But if you have Graves' disease, you're like so excited because at least levothyroxine is a stable dose instead of your thyroid like right. this forever. But you can really see those parathyroid glands well. But again, it gives you the option. We know this from how Google is driving cars and Tesla is driving cars. Once you can capture the video, all of a sudden, you can feed that video into artificial intelligence. You can start to really develop the next set of teaching surgeons how to protect critical structures. Again, we all love good old fashioned surgery where you use a scalpel and you make a cut. It's so hard to capture the data unless you have it under a camera. Mm -hmm. And what scarless surgery does is it lets you keep that data, learn from the data and be able to teach robots and, you know, really advance the field as, and marry this with all of the technologies that we have. Parathyroid yeah. and radio frequency. I think we're all excited about it, but the problem with parathyroid surgery is that it's different than thyroid surgery, right? So, so thyroid surgery, we talked about, it's kind of this like quality of life playground where you get to pick what you want to do and how much risk you want to have. And if you want to lose your thyroid or not, parathyroid's different, right? Okay. If, if you have a parathyroid problem, there are very clear guidelines about when you do need surgery and when you don't. And we know that if you do need surgery, Surgery actually really helps you. It mm -hmm. will, you know, improve your quality of life significantly. It will prevent future complications. You're going to be better off if you have surgery. And so all of a sudden you have these rigid guidelines saying, hey, you need surgery. The thing about parathyroid surgery is if you're a good parathyroid surgeon, the surgery should take you about 15 minutes. It's 15 minutes. The complication rate is almost zero. There's a handful of us that can do it with no scar. And so it's kind of like you start to say, okay, if I can do something that well, and it's different than thyroid problems because you don't then have to go on to take thyroid hormone for, or right. something like that for the rest of your life. You just fix the problem, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's a little bit harder with radio frequency because some of the early radio frequency studies that focused on the parathyroid ended up having a relatively high rate of recurrent laryngeal nerve palsies. So people mm. would talk differently after radio frequency ablation of the parathyroid. And that's because the parathyroid is right next to the nerve every single time. Okay. And so if you go in and you treat the parathyroid gland, you have a relatively high risk of hurting the nerve. Mm -hmm. When you do surgery, you can see, right? And, mm -hmm. and when you can see, you can protect. And if you can't see, like you with radio frequency ablation, the ultrasounds are really good, but it's pretty hard to really see that nerve mm -hmm. floating in space next to a parathyroid gland. And you can do things to protect it. You can create these bubbles around it. You can do all these things, but it's probably going to take you longer than the 15 minutes it would take you for parathyroid surgery. We all have to experiment as we're learning how to do it. Mm -hmm. And some of those early series had like 20 and 30% voice change rates, which oh, wow. with surgery, it's like, one in a thousand sort of thing. Right. And so it's kind of like, okay, at the end of the day, am I helping my patient? Because of course nobody wants surgery, but there's grades of surgery. You know, there's eight hour surgery and there's 15 minute surgery. You mentioned voice changes, you know, with RFA, I believe 1% of patients have temporary voice changes. Can you talk about that some? I can actually, I, I had <laughs> my first patient freak me out with it. Um, oh no! She, no, well, she had a small thyroid nodule, and so we of course put local anesthesia, which is just the lidocaine that your dentist uses. We put that all the way around her thyroid because she had a small thyroid and a small nodule, but where it was at, it was bothering her. And we treated it, and everything went great. And you know, at the end of the procedure, she was like, "Hold on, why did my voice change?" 
And so anybody that says that, because again, as a surgeon, we have the ability to kind of like look down people's noses and kind of look at their vocal cords right then and there. And so I looked down and sure enough, her voice box wasn't moving normally. And so, oh my gosh, you, you freak out about it a lot. And then, you know, we, we double check and okay, I was far away from the nerve. I know that, you know, what you'd go through, what else did we do? And about two hours later, after the numbing medication wore off, her voice went right back to normal. And oh, so, good. so thankfully, this is the thing, right? A good surgeon mm -hmm. who does a lot of thyroid surgery should have a complication rate of, you know, between, we, we say 1%, but most of us are well below that. When you talk about radiofrequency ablation, again, you have to be better than really good if you want to be able to, to say to patients that, hey, this is a safe option for you. And fortunately, you know, as we have these collaborations and groups around the country, it is very rare. In fact, I'm, I'm not aware of any of my colleagues who have had a permanent voice change right. that has lasted longer than a few months. Mm -hmm. And so that, and those are really the ones we're worried about. You know, short term is a, is a huge inconvenience and I don't mean to minimize it at all. If my patient gets better, you know, you can sleep at night. To my knowledge, I think everybody has had really good results with it. There's a lot going on inside of there. When we do surgery, we kind of force these nerves. We, we guide the nerve to gently go into a safe spot. We've been trained for decades how to do that. With radiofrequency ablation, is there a nuance that we don't understand? You know, are these nerves kind of staying up higher on the capsule because we haven't rotated everything out and pushed it down like we do through our stepwise progression of surgery. There's a lot that we still need to learn about this, and it's gonna be fun to see what happens. The number of studies that are going to come out is mind boggling. Yeah, are you guys doing any trials at, at Johns Hopkins? We are, so we're, mm -hmm. we're doing a few. So the ones that we've done so far have combined kind of looking at the radio frequency head to head with the ethanol ablation, mm -hmm. and kind of seeing which one's better. And very clearly the radio frequency wins, you know, just as far as the volume re reduction rate, being about twice what you get with ethanol ablation over the same amount of time. Patient satisfaction is also through the roof. Bare bones of what we're doing is kind of focusing on that. As we talk with our colleagues, we have some differences of opinion about who we all think is the best person to treat with radiofrequency ablation. And so I think all of us agree that if you have a benign thyroid nodule and it's bothering you, and you don't want to take thyroid hormone, you are the person for radio frequency. Hands down, right. you're perfect. And anybody that tells you otherwise had better have a really good reason. And it better not be because they don't do it. <laughs> and some people say, oh, well, it's too big. No, it's not too big. That being said, you have to be really clear with patients, right? Like, what is your objective? If your objective is to make your 20 centimeter nodule disappear, well, right. then you should have surgery. You know, because radio frequency ablation is not going to make a 20 centimeter nodule go away. And I do have patients that show up like that. Really? And, and, you know, you just have to set expectations, right? I'm not going to make this disappear. If I get a 50% reduction in volume, I'm going to feel ecstatic because of how huge yeah. this thing is. You're going to need at least a few treatments if you want right. to get it less than that. And even at the end of that, you still might have to have surgery, you know, and you just have to be clear, like, what are you hoping to accomplish here? Mm -hmm. But I, I think once you get past that, then you start to get into some gray areas. And we talked about small cancers. And I think because we are choosing to watch some of those small cancers, I think most of us agree that that's an easy place to move into next. Mm -hmm. Is to say, if we're just going to watch it, then we might as well treat it with radiofrequency ablation and see what we get. Again, going back to that kind of playground. And that's a bad word, but you know, it's, it's kind of gives the idea of we're trying to learn together and give our patients what they want as we try to learn how we can help people better. That's the goal. As you talk about these other things, I think you come into this big group of indeterminate thyroid nodules. 20% of biopsies are indeterminate. When you have a biopsy that comes back and says there's a low risk of cancer, that's when all of my colleagues across the world kind of start to splinter into mm -hmm. what we should do next. For me, it seems pretty clear what we should do. And, and we've got these great molecular markers, right? The Affirma test, the Thyroseq, the Thyromir, all of these really good tests that tell us a probability of cancer. I think at the end of the day, for me, it comes down to kind of the Hippocratic Oath, right? First do no harm is the first thing that we have to talk about. Mm -hmm. And if my patient has a chance of having cancer, all of a sudden, to me, it kind of changes the conversation a little bit. I know 
that if you have cancer, I can almost always fix that cancer with surgery. I know if you have a four centimeter nodule that might have cancer, there is no way that I will make that disappear with radiofrequency ablation. And so I guess to me, it comes back to the first do no harm. And I say, I'm not sure that I'm not harming you by making you think that I have treated something that I have not fully treated. And so some of my colleagues disagree and they say, well, these molecular markers are really good. And if you've got a clean molecular marker profile, well, that's just as good as a negative biopsy. I'm not convinced that the data is right there at this point. And all of us have treated patients who have had, you know, even benign nodules come back as cancer, right? Yeah. But, you know, that's the best that we can do. But I, you know, when we get these molecular markers and we know that there's at least a small chance of cancer, you really have to pause I don't offer radiofrequency ablation to those patients. And there's colleagues that I respect very much that do. It just comes down to, I know with surgery, I'm safe. Uh -huh. I know if you watch this nodule, if it grows, you will know that it's cancer and you will go to a surgeon and take it out. But that in-between ground where you have an indeterminate nodule and I treat it with radiofrequency ablation and it kind of shrinks, but it doesn't all the way shrink and it kind of grows. We don't know what that means. Mm -hmm. Those are the patients that, to me, I might be hurting them by letting a cancer grow that we all think we have treated. You know, you get a 30-year-old patient who 20 years later finds out that she had a cancer that you didn't treat, and now it's spread through her body. That, to me, gets a little bit scary. These are kind of the conversations that we're having. Mm -hmm. And to be totally honest, that's a conversation that I have every single time with my patients, even when they have benign biopsies, right? Like, the expectation is two benign biopsies, unless it just sonographically is completely reassuring. But even then, some patients we know from surgery, benign nodules sometimes come back as cancer. Again, you have to have a patient who's all in with an understanding of, unless I take it out, I can't guarantee you it's not cancer. And mm -hmm. that doesn't mean I need to take it out. And that doesn't mean that I'm pushing to take it out. Mm -hmm. In fact, I'm not pushing if you have a benign nodule but you have to understand that I don't know and you don't know. Mm -hmm. And so after radiofrequency, you still need follow-up. You need to right. be seeing your endocrinologist. You need ultrasounds. You need all of these things for the rest of your life because you've still got a nodule. I really appreciate your perspective on that. A lot of people, you know, they're like, why don't you right. just zap it? You're going to zap it anyway if it's benign. And I think maybe what I would love your feedback on the most is the known indolence of most thyroid cancers, I think is what tends to drive a lot of people's thinking towards, well, let's, let's treat it because this is primarily not lethal. <laughs> uh, and so like you were talking about the indeterminates, is that a case when you might not necessarily know if it's going to spread or not? Yes, it okay. is. Okay. Okay. You know, for, for example, I had a conversation yesterday with a patient in clinic. He's a you know 80 year old guy who 20 years ago had an indeterminate nodule, had surgery, and it came back as a Herthel cell cancer. Thought everything was good, and 10 years later the cancer came back, mm -hmm. and it had knocked out one vocal cord and had grown into his voice box to a point that he needed to have his whole voice box come out. And and as I talk to him, I say to him, Hey, look, you know everybody tells me that thyroid cancer doesn't kill anybody. And so it's not a big deal. What do you think about that? And he swears and says, yeah, well, you know what I think about it. Like thyroid cancer probably won't kill you, but mm -hmm. it can really mess you up. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's, we treat it with respect. It's still cancer. And if mm -hmm. it spreads to your lungs and, it, and if you have to have multiple treatments of radioactive iodine, and then all of a sudden you've got dry eyes and dry mouth and you get mm. all of these other things down the road, cancer is still cancer. And just because it doesn't kill most people, Mm -hmm. doesn't mean that it doesn't cause problems for a lot of people. I've been told that thyroid cancer is actually one of the only cancers where the mortality is actually going up year over year. And so even though we say, oh, all of these cancers are like very indolent cancers, they're slow growing, they're not going to hurt people. Overall, more people are dying of thyroid cancer now than they were 30 years ago. And it's one of the only cancers in America where that is the case. And it's partly because we are finding more aggressive thyroid cancers. It's partly because some of these smaller ones are gathering other mutations and becoming more aggressive. None of that is to say, hey, look, everybody on this listening in on this, you need to have surgery and take your nodules out. That's not what we're saying. And that is not appropriate. You have to weigh everything. You have to personalize this and you have to know yourself as a patient. Uh -huh. How anxious am I? When you lie awake at night trying to fall asleep, 
what's going to keep you awake? Is it mm -hmm. fear of cancer? Is it mm -hmm. fear of thyroid hormone? Like mm -hmm. whichever one it is, that's the itch I want to scratch. That's the thing that I want to make you sleep at night because both options are good options. We touched on your training experience. When you were training in RFA, how did that compare to you training for other innovations like the scarless surgery? Was it something you would say was more challenging or um, required different skill sets than anything you had ever done previously? I think you have to have a vision of where things are going. So I actually did investment banking before I went to medical school. And so it's kind oh. of like you, you have to have like look two or three steps ahead of mm -hmm. where are things going. Mm -hmm. And so as I finished my training, it was pretty clear that the next thing that was going to be coming was using energy to be able to ablate things with less, you know, morbidity, right? Like radio frequency ablation or high flu or something like that. And so from the beginning, I started off doing all of my own biopsies, right? Because it's the same skill set. You use mm -hmm. an ultrasound, you take a small needle, you stick it in, you make sure you get enough cells. And you get feedback on whether or not you put the needle in the right spot because you can get a diagnosis or you don't get a diagnosis. Kind of as, as we talk to the trainees, we kind of say, hey, look, what's three steps ahead from now? What skill sets are foundational for you to be able to learn these other things? And I think the foundational skill set that you need for radio frequency ablation, you have to be doing ultrasound on every single patient that you see or almost every single patient that you see. And you have to be doing lots of biopsies at least until you're so sick of doing biopsies that you can get into radio frequency ablation. And then you just have to be doing lots of it. It's about just technique. And it's great. These collaborations that spring up these international collaborations, mm -hmm. but sometimes we say, why do doctors need to go to China? You know what I mean? Like what, what, what happens when you go to South Korea or Thailand or these, what are these doctors doing? My friends that I have on the opposite side of the world, those are the people that we talk to and we say, Hey, what are you doing right now? Because yeah. In Thailand, guess what? There's no lawyers that are going to sue you because you try transoral thyroidectomy. <laughs> you know, in the U.S., I can't necessarily do that until somebody else proves that it's safe to do it. And yeah. then the second that they do it, I can go and learn and I can say, I can weigh it and decide, okay, is this a good thing or not a good thing? And so having these international collaborations really is exciting. A lot of these Asian countries have been doing so many of these different things for a long time because... They have these screening programs set up where they identify cancers and nodules earlier than we do in the United States. Uh -huh. And then they have these healthcare systems that encourage and allow people to be able to have treatment a lot easier than sometimes it is here. And so they get these high volumes of very good technical surgeons who are able to learn these things and then propagate them. It's great to go over and you watch these things. And sometimes you watch them and you're like, yeah, that's not a good thing. And other ones, you see them, and, and this is what it was with scarless thyroid surgery for me, and then radio frequency as well. You watch somebody who's good at it, and within about 15 minutes, you say, I need to be doing that. That is cool, because look at what they're doing, and why aren't we offering that in the United States? Mm -hmm. And and then you have to come back and convince everybody that you can do it, and you know that's a whole rigmarole in and of itself. One of the fun things about being in a place like Johns Hopkins is you really... It's your job is to be on the front of all of these things, right? Mm -hmm. And to be saying, what else can I add to my toolkit so that we can offer it to patients and then make sure it works, right? And three years from now, if we find out every single one of these RFA patients still needs surgery, well, then we're going to have egg on our face and we're going to go back and say, well, darn it, guys. You know, I don't know why in Korea they said 20 years of data and everybody was perfect. And now here in the United States, everybody still needs surgery, you know, but but I don't really think that that's the case. You know no, I, I don't mean? believe so either. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody on this call needs to understand radio frequency is new. You know, it's, it's something mm -hmm. new. And when it's new, those are the things that we're still learning. Mm -hmm. so. And at Johns Hopkins, I, I read that you all were the first head and neck surgeons in the U.S. to offer RFA. I believe that that is true. Yeah. So we started so, a little bit more than two years ago. Are you guys training physicians there? Yeah, well, there was this little thing called COVID that has really put a damper on all yeah. of our training. Yeah, so we used to, we we have these great cadaver courses a couple of times a year mm -hmm. before COVID, have people come from all around the world and it's awesome. You know, you have, you have 70 or 80 surgeons that all come together. And one of my favorite stories is we had a, a surgeon from Brazil who was a really fiery guy and he happened to get a cadaver who had already had a thyroidectomy. 
Oh no. <laughs> and so we were trying to teach this guy how to do scarlet thyroid surgery on a cadaver who had already had a thyroidectomy. So yeah, so these, these courses are great. We try and do them at least a couple times a year. We have done a lot of Zoom training with a lot of the people that you've had on your program. And you know, we just have these collaborations and try and do everything we can to spread the word that this is something you should be considering. How long did you work with Dr. Tofano? So it's sad, he's actually, today was his last clinic here at Hopkins. Oh. Um, yeah, yeah I knew getting, he, he was leaving. He will definitely be missed, but I'm mm -hmm. sure all the people in Florida are gonna love to have him done. Uh, so he and I started working together in 15. So he was my fellowship director when I got here in 15. And since then, he has just been my colleague. And he's, he's a great guy because he's a strong personality. And anytime that you've got a strong personality, it's really great because you're going to fight for things that you believe in. And mm -hmm. so he and I have had a lot of you know great conversations over the years and arguments and all sorts of different things. And I think it makes both of us better. So if any of you 2,400 people listening to this or like know of a good thyroid surgeon, I need a partner at Hopkins who's going to challenge us and kind of push us in, in new things. So I know he will be missed. He's, he's a really great guy. I enjoyed interviewing him too. And I can see the same passion that he had in you too. So I, I think anyone who comes in and, uh, and gets to work with you is going to have a really great setup, you know, just being able to, to do, be on the forefront of all of this and being able to, to learn how all these different therapeutics can come together and just be the best possible outcome for a patient. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for mm -hmm. your excitement and care for patients' outcomes and quality of life. It's exciting to talk with doctors who are passionate about what they do. Well, thank you for starting this group and keeping this group going and educating people in ways that I can't educate. You know, it's good. And, and frankly, you probably have more credibility because you've been through it as a patient and, you, like, and you're doing this out of the good of your heart and it's something that you're passionate about. And so I think that resonates with a lot of patients to say, hey, there's somebody who is actually cares about it enough. So good for you. Keep fighting the good fight. You know, let Thank us know you. how we can help. <laughs> Please feel free to point patients to us if, if they're feeling overwhelmed mm -hmm. and they need feedback or resources. We try to do the best we can just to educate. The biggest thing I, I say in the group is this is not a place for advertising. We're not here to promote anybody. We're just here to educate you. And then you take that information and you decide what's best for you. So we're just we're just trying to be a resource. Thank you for contributing. Patients love to hear fr straight from the doctor about this procedure. Is it, these videos, I've, I've gotten a lot of feedback that they're very helpful. So I really appreciate your contribution. Good, thanks for having me. Thank you so much for watching. You can help others tremendously by sharing this content. Never forget to educate yourself and be your own health advocate. Now, watch this next interview right here.